again, everyone. I'm Kathy Zip, Managing Editor of Solar Power World, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Utilizing Aluminum Extrusion to Reduce System Costs. And before we begin, we'll just go over a few house cleaning items. I'd like to mention that this webinar will be available after the presentation on solarpowerworldonline.com. I know a lot of people ask if they can get copies of the webinar, um, and you can. It will be emailed to all registrants, so you will be able to view it again at your convenience. Secondly, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. And this is a good way to pick our presenters' brains, so we encourage you to participate. You can do so by submitting your questions whenever they come to mind, by typing them into the GoToMeeting panel on the right at any time during the presentations. And lastly, we encourage everyone to tweet about key topics and discuss takeaways. You can use the Twitter hashtag SolarWebinar. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Today, we're thrilled to have Jason Weber, Director of Business Development for Energy and Industrial Products at Apple Extrusions North America, and Craig Warner, President of Warner Extrusion Solutions. So we're very excited to have both of them here with us today. Thank you both. And Jason's actually going to present first. He has over 17 years of experience in the aluminum extrusion industry. He's a member of the Aluminum Extruders Council and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and Marketing from Minot State University in North Dakota. So we're excited to have him here with us today to share his expertise. And Jason, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Kathy. Um, during today's presentation, we'll talk about uh, two, two main topics. And my portion will focus on aluminum as a material and extrusion as a process and the roles both the material and the process plays within the, um, the ability to lower cost and the installed system cost of solar, solar systems. Um, as Kathy mentioned, this is the second part of a two-part series. Um, and again, both of the, uh, the links to the presentations will be sent out after today's webinar event. Um, moving forward, I will, I will leave it on slide six for now, but if uh, we quickly advance past slide four, which is actually a, a, a pie chart of current system costs. And as, as most of us all know and have seen over the last couple of years, the cost of modules and has, have, as they have fallen over time, um, whereas we normally would have seen a system cost would have been 50% uh, made up of the module cost, now is less than 25 and sometimes it's around 22. So today in today's systems we're looking at system costs of around 34% which is made up of the racking and the cabling component. As we drive down and continue to work towards grid parity, um, we're seeing parts of the world today that are already at that level. But as we need to move closer to grid parity, it becomes more important that we continue to drive down the cost of the racking component within the system itself, as that makes up the furthest uh, or the largest part of the installed system cost today. Sorry, I'm trying to advance the slide. So, so in today's, today's area, we're going to look at installations made up of commercial ground mount, uh, as well as rooftop, residential, light commercial, and as well as building integrated PV, and even a little bit of CSP. And more so, it's, it's just the role of aluminum and extrusions and how they play into these various um, types of system installations. As we continue to move or try to move down the cost curve, one of the, uh, one of the items that keeps on bring, being brought up is the cost of steel versus aluminum. And if you look at the overall price, the total price of steel versus the total price of aluminum, one can say that obviously steel is cheaper on a per pound basis. 
But typically what's not factored into that decision is the fact that aluminum weighs a third that of steel, which will, which will benefit in terms of the, the fact that the same amount of, of aluminum will make basically three times the number of parts, um, as well as the reduced processing and assembly costs from the designed in functionality that you'll have in the extrusions itself, as well as the speed to market that you can get because the extrusion process is faster in going from raw material to finished product. And then over time, as the system ages, you'll have maintenance savings because aluminum is, has some very good corrosion properties, as well as then at the end of life of the system, where we're looking at the, the costs and actually the, the, the money that can be recouped once that system is recycled. So for the next slides, we'll talk a little bit about the extrusion process and the benefits associated with them. So for extrusions themselves, or excuse me, for aluminum themselves, as you couple it with the extrusion process, there's a, there's a few main points that I would bring up that um, would we'll talk about the, uh, the advantages of each of the, not only the material, but also the process. So when we start talking about aluminum and its advantages, obviously we have a lightweight material. We have a high strength to weight material. And for a renewable energy system, we have a, a material that is corrosion resistant. Couple that with the extrusion process, we're looking at a tailored performance so we can make a custom shape or design specifically for a purpose. We can, it's suitable for complex and integral shapes, as well as relatively short production lead time as compared to other materials. So and again, we're going to combine these, this material with this process and create savings due to aluminum's lightweight, the secondary weight savings of other system elements. So for instance, in a tracking system where you might have to have a larger motor and or bigger bearings to be able to handle the load of a steel system, because aluminum weighs less, one can actually use smaller motors um, more bearings and actually, or less bearings and actually get more life out of the system itself. And that, that goes for tracking systems in PV as well as CSP. Um, again, with the integral features, which is part of what we'll talk about as far as extrusions go and the extrusion design, and Craig will get more in, in depth than that during his part of the presentation, but basically during the extrusion process, we're actually adding in the features that in other processes would need to be put in on second or during secondary operations. Um, we're going to look at optimized site-specific solutions. Um, in there, we talk about lower tooling costs, which we'll discuss later, simplified assembly and installation, which can be done through profile design. And then, of course, as always, we'll talk about the advantages of aluminum as a material and the fact that there is a, a good amount of corrosion resistance in the material, as well as the high end-of-life recycling value to the material itself. So the first set of slides will talk about aluminum and its advantages within the system. So first of all, it's lightweight. So as everybody knows, aluminum is only about as third as heavy as steel or copper and brass. And therefore, because of the lighter weight material, will help minimize your transportation costs. In rooftop applications, commercial and residential, there's a benefit in the light weighting component and that you're able to get more material on the roof, more system on the roof, and therefore drive uh, the cost down uh, by optimizing the space for the system. So and again, we can talk about lightweight as it pertains to um, other elements within the system when we discuss the tracking and of the system itself. So overall, a comparable one megawatt ground mount system in steel uh, as compared to aluminum, the aluminum system will weigh overall 60% less. Another attribute of, of aluminum as a material is its high strength to weight ratio. Here's a Here's an example from today's world um, where we're looking at the new uh, model Corvette, which is an aluminum intensive vehicle. It uses both steel castings, or excuse me, aluminum sheet extrusions and castings in its superstructure. 
Um, although that structure is 90 pounds lighter than the old frame, it's actually 60% stiffer than the current steel or than the previous steel version of that. So we can increase performance too. Um, another benefit of aluminum is that it's electrically conductive. Obviously that helps in facilitating the grounding of the system. And then for some of the other components, it actually is used as in, in heat sink material and dissipating the heat. So you see aluminum used in inverters um, as well as some of the other um, components within the, uh, within the balance of system. One of the biggest benefits of aluminum is that it is corrosion resistant. Um, the two examples noted here, uh, one on the left is Nevada Solar One, which is a large CSP installation, uh, which was installed in 2007, which it uses a, utilizes a aluminum intensive uh, superstructure. Um, through, within that system itself, there's been virtually no mirror or frame failures to date on that system. Compare that to an older style steel steel system that was installed in the late 80s and early 90s, you'll actually have a number of failures in that system due to this, the fatigue of the steel, uh, which is also called mirror, mirror failures, which is one of the biggest parts of the, um, or biggest cost of the operation of that system. So aluminum on its own, it would develop its own oxide layer. So aluminum is very reactive, which means that it will easily bond with other elements. In this case, it will bond with the oxygen in the atmosphere. So in, in our instance of extrusion, immediately after the profile is extruded or emerges from the extrusion press, this natural layer starts to build up. And it is that aluminum oxide layer which offers a natural protective coating to the aluminum. One other point of note, aluminum does not get brittle as it gets colder, um, whereas steel, plastics, and other materials tend to get more brittle. Um, so aluminum offers very good cryogenic strength. One of the advantages of the extrusion process itself is that we're able to produce profiles to close tolerances. We'll say close tolerances or tight tolerances, they're not necessarily machine tolerances. Um, however, one of the advantages of the extrusion process is that you're basically doing this in a, in a lineal format, so that tolerance will carry throughout the whole length of the part. So in this particular example that's shown here is that there is actually two profiles that are mated together. So as an aluminum extruder, we'll produce many profiles that are, that are snap fit or slide fits or fitting together with another, another piece or another profile. Um, that people are using to join them together that way versus the um, versus welding or some other type of mechanical fastening. Um, another advantage of the extrusion is that we simply extrude the shape as required. Um, we don't have to build the shape up from multiple different pieces and multiple different forms. So you'll actually have a, a single shape that's all one monolithic structure um, versus other type of weldments which are built up from, from multiple different pieces. So another advantage of an extrusion in the fact that you have one piece, you don't have to do any further uh, fabrication to it to get it to its final form. Here's an example of a, of a roof mount PV rail. Um, this was provided to us by Luma Solar in Boulder, Colorado. This shows some some of the different advantages of the extrusion process where they've actually built in the, the different features into the profile itself. So this emerges out of the press basically as is except for the holes that are punched in uh, on the bottom flange which are used for, um, for mounting as well as for drainage. So you can see on the top upper left uh, right hand corner we have the nut channel um, where the different um, hardware pieces fit into. We also have screw bosses where the end caps are fixed to and screwed directly onto the end of the profile. Uh, we also have the, uh, the wireway here, which is a hollow void that's extruded into the profile. So part of the, uh, the aluminum 
an advantage of, of aluminum is that you have a wide range of finishes to choose from. That particular example itself that we had there was, um, was anodized. It, it also can be powder coated. And that's the two basic types of finishes other than the mill finish that we supply as an aluminum extruder. One is anodized, the other one being paint, which can be wet or powder. But typically, in a, in a mounting system structure, unless it's required for aesthetic purposes, as in some commercial rooftop applications or, or some residential applications, painting or coating the aluminum is not necessary due to its natural ability to resist corrosion. However, most of what we've been discussing is how you can basically build in the functionality into the profile to get the end design that you require. If there is additional further processing that is required, machining, punching, drilling, um, cutting, any, anything beyond that, one of the good attributes of aluminum is that it is easy to fabricate. So machine rates, um, punch rates are, are a lot quicker than they are in most other types of metal fabrication because of the malleability and the ductility of the aluminum, which makes it easier to cut and uh, do the secondary processing too. A lot of times in working with extrusions, there's an opportunity to, again, design in the functionality into the part itself. So we work a lot in joining and how do we fit multiple pieces together. This is an example. Um, I'll be an extreme example, but this one profile that you see on the left is basically built in various types of functions into the profile itself. And then obviously there's a, there's a lot to be said for you know, the ease of assembly that that creates. So not only are we looking at trying to reduce part count by you know designing in a variety of different features so that you know a smaller amount of profiles can be used to do. Um, a job that maybe many other parts would be used for before, but also then the assembly and looking at the framing systems um, and different parts of, uh, of the system that are, are in use today. One of the things I mentioned before is the cost effective uh, part of the aluminum extrusion. And one of the things that we, we work a lot with is obviously dies and, and tooling design and how that's going to, to come about. For the aluminum extrusion process itself, um, tooling is relatively inexpensive as compared to other processes. So here you can see this chart where we're looking at a typical extrusion tool that can be between $500 and $5,000. Tools will range in cost depending on basically the size of the press that they fit on size of the profile, the bigger the profile, the bigger the tool, the more the part cost is going to be, um, or the more the tool cost is going to be. But again, as compared to most uh, other processes, the cost for this is relatively um, inexpensive. There is uh, another advantage when it comes to, to tooling lead time. Uh, typical tool lead time could be between two and four weeks. Um, again, more complex tool is going to take a little bit longer. But basically, these two parts marry up to allow uh, a company utilizing aluminum extrusions to basically do the sequential prototyping of components very quickly. Um, so we can, we can do it quicker. We can do it less expensive than other forms of, um, of tooling. And typically in, in our process, the, if we are doing a prototype part. The prototype tool is the production tool. So there's really not even another lag uh, that you might have with some other processes where you do a prototype first and then you work on the production. It's, it's really one and the same for us. There is no difference between prototype and production. Um, for aluminum itself, we've talked a lot about end of life uh, and the value that that is. One of the other benefits to aluminum is that it's a highly desirable material. There is a very robust scrap loop globally that will work to recycle all the aluminum that's out there and available. Um, aluminum can be recycled over and over again. It does not degrade over time. 
Um, and an interesting fact is that 75% of all the aluminum that's ever been made since it became commercially available in 1888 is still in use today. So basically when this material is done, when it's went through its life cycle in whatever uh, system it's part of, it can be recycled, it can be melted back down again, and new aluminum parts can be made out of it. And you'll see that typically in a typical extrusion operation, it will be dependent upon alloy, but you'll have somewhere in the range of about 50% um, scrap content in that billet that's used to make the extruded part. As final set of slides where we have done an analysis, or actually a company called IBS and Associates did a, an economic analysis of all the different types of of mounting systems from the, the commercial flat roof through different sizes of utility uh, scale systems as well as CSP, which you'll see at, on the next slide, um, and looked at the entire installation cost. So this, this basically stops at the point where a system was completed installation and energized and is making power. And through the use of aluminum and the advantages of the different parts, you can actually see that over time that that aluminum system was actually cheaper than the steel system that was uh, installed. Um, and here's just a, a comparison of the different materials that were looked at. And granted, this is, um, this is the analysis that was done for a, a CSP system and the different systems that were available but at the same time, utilizing you know, this same methodology, the same thing holds true to PV systems, is that um, really through the advantages of the installation costs and, and the design of the parts and the lower tooling costs, um, that there is a, a significant advantage in utilizing aluminum and uh, extruded parts. Next, I'll turn it over to Craig, and Craig will take you through the design of the cost-effective solutions uh, with extrusion. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so again, Craig Warner is the president of uh, Warner Extrusion Solutions, an extrusion design and process consulting firm. He also serves as chairman of the Aluminum Extruders Council's Academy Program. Craig has over 30 years of extrusion experience, having grown up literally in the industry as a member of Warner the world's leading ladder producer, and a custom aluminum extruder with exceptional technical capabilities. Craig holds a bachelor's degree in industrial and manufacturing systems engineering from Penn State, and a master's degree in industrial administration from Carnegie Mellon. So now that the audience knows you better, Craig, go ahead and uh, give them your expertise there. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Uh, Jason took us uh, through some of the reasons why aluminum and aluminum extrusions in particular are very cost effective, particularly in uh, uh, solar framing. Um, and he talked a lot about the advantages, being able to put metal where you want it and being able to design things that with features and benefits and ways to snap and fit together. I'm going to take you through a little bit more on how do you design things out of extrusions. Uh, because sometimes people get used to working with a material like, like steel, for example, and they may feel uh, a little bit uh, cautious about working with a different material. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, the alloy selection, uh, shape design, and uh, how you can structurally design systems and parts to work effectively. So that's my goal today. First, just a quick glance. This is what the extrusion process looks like. Uh, the equipment's all missing. We can just see the aluminum billet as feedstock feeding through a die, uh, and then coming out the die, there's uh, some support tooling behind it, and then finally you have the final extruded part. Um, in this case, you know, you're missing the, the extrusion press that would be around this. It would be producing, you know, five and a half to maybe 10 million pounds of force, pushing this billet through a die and extruding it out, extruding a solid material into a final profile, which is a pretty cool process to see. Once... Uh, once it comes out the front of the press, you can have multi-hole dies. This happens to be a three-hole die, where each of the profiles coming out is in itself a three-void hollow. You can see the three holes in the end. So they are extruded out to very, very long lengths, 150 to 250 to 200 feet long, typically. And then they're uh, 
cut into the proper size. It goes through an industrial process where you know the billets are heated, it's extruded, uh, it's cooled down, it's stretched, it goes through a sawing operation, and you finally end up with the final pieces which are aged for uh, for better mechanical properties and uh, then fabricated and finished however the customer needs. So uh, next step in this process is to talk a little bit about aluminum sorry about uh, aluminum extrusions. And you know, while we talk about all the advantages that they have, and they do have some tremendous advantages that Jason went through, there's also some limitations. Um, one of the primary limitations is the circle size. Uh, if you look in the middle of the screen, that yellow shape is actually an extrusion. And this is meant to represent um, an extrusion that's actually used in the solar field. It's not the actual design, but it's close to it. And uh, this shape has about a 12.9 inch circle size. So that part would require a very large press to extrude it because the tooling for it would have to have enough room for a 13 inch piece to come out the front. So often circle size is a limitation. The larger the circle size, the larger the press, and the fewer presses available, and therefore perhaps the more expensive. And when you start getting really, really large, there may be very few or no presses available. So typically when you design things out of extrusion, you take circle size into account. You try to design things that are you know, typically less than 10 inch. I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, there's also a little bit about uh, weight per foot, and we'll get that into that in a moment, and tongue ratios, which I will also show you. So this is a chart that's available on the AEC website, but it basically shows um, those shapes which are widely available, and that's in the uh, bright green with the W by it. Uh, shapes that are you know less from less than one inch to over to about 10 inch circle size are widely available. The larger the shape, the less likely you can get a very very light section. And if you have a very small shape, in contrast, like less than one inch, you'll have, you won't be able to get parts that are too heavy because there's not enough room to put the metal into it. But these Ws represent widely available. G is generally available. So when you get up above a 14-inch circle size, there are presses in North America that can make them, but there's fewer and fewer of those available. So just something to take into consideration. You're going to hear me say over and over again, work with extruders as you develop your projects, because they can help to guide you in the right way to make sure that you come up with designs and features that are uh, to take best advantage of the material and reduce the cost. One of the primary things you're going to have to think about is what alloy to make it out of. There are many different uh, alloys available. One of the older of the alloys is the uh, yellowish 6061 alloy that's shown there, yellow just on this graph. Uh, and this is a graph that shows the percentage of magnesium and silicon, which is the primary alloy ingredients in um, the 6000 series alloys. The farther up and to the right you go, the stronger the material. Um, 6061 is a very, very popular alloy, been around for a long time, but there are actually much newer alloys that, that perform better, particularly for some of these structural solar applications. 6005A is an excellent one. If you need the modulus but not the uh, necessarily the yield and ultimate strength, 6060 and 6063 are also very good alternatives. It's certainly possible to make things out of 6061 or 6082, which gives you higher yield strength on 6082, higher yield and ultimate. But there's a cost to that because they don't process quite as readily as the other alloys. So this is a graph showing a com comparison of the strengths in tensile and yield for different materials going from the aircraft 7000 series alloys to the, the next hardest would be the 6082 alloy down to what I think is really a great alloy for solar application 6005A and 6063. And on the bottom axis is the extrudability index. So for example, if a shape would run at 100 feet per minute, on out of 6060 or 6063, it'll only run about half that fast on 6082. So the reason for using 6005, unless you really, really need the higher uh, alloy, the higher strength, is that uh, you're paying for two things. You're paying for press time, and you're also paying for material. So it's a balance between those two to determine the most cost-effective solution. The other advantage that new, uh, some of the newer alloys uh, offer, and particularly 6005A compared to 6061, is they basically have the same or better properties and uh, processing capabilities are often quite a bit better. So 6061, which has been in wide use for many, many years, is a wonderful alloy. It has great applications all around the world. It's been well proven. But it doesn't extrude very well. 6005A extrudes better. and It also requires less uh, rigorous quench. Because of that, uh, you can often keep 
parts from uh, bowing or twisting. Often if you have a part that has a heavy section and a light section, it can you can get some distortion in it during the water quench if you need water quenching like you would on 6061. And also depending on the profile makeup, sometimes there's like an internal piece, this little rib here on this part, for example. It would be uh, almost impossible to get water to that, so you're relying on conduction. So when you have a material that is not quite so quench sensitive, it's, it's better. It just makes it easier to process. When you're working with extruders, you'll be, you'll be talking about solids and hollows and semi-hollows and different types of uh, shapes, and they'll talk you through this. And there's a reason for it that things are classified this way, because uh, the more difficult, the higher classes become uh, more difficult to manufacture, not impossible, but uh, often take a little bit more time or uh, have a little bit greater tooling cost. The, um, the next section I'm going to talk you through is covered in more depth in the first uh, presentation that was done about a year ago. Uh, and it's, it's some good, good design practices for extrusions. And I'm going to take you through this, but this is really something that you'd be well, uh, it, it'd be good for you to work with extruders on this directly. Because while you may have knowledge of you know, 10 or 100 different shapes that you've worked with, they may have worked with 10,000 or 100,000 different shapes. They've seen it all, they've done it all. So you know, the, the advantage is they may have solutions to your problem or your technical issue that you're trying to work up a connection or something, and they may be able to tell you really clever ways to make things work. But So when you see things like on this uniformity, it's better to have uniform walls. Extrusions run nicer with uniform walls. But this extrusion on the left, it'll run perfectly fine. Just probably won't run quite as quickly. And if you don't need this extra meat in the walls, you're giving away some extra metal. On the right, this one with the red circle on it that says not this, that's easily extrudable. But that center wall will uh, be harder to fill the metal into there. So the extrusion will probably run a little bit slower than the one on the right. So a designer who is not familiar with extrusion may think that they're saving a little bit of weight, but they may put extra cost into the profile by trading off that little bit of weight savings against a much slower extrusion speed. So they may find what they think they're doing to save money is actually costing them a little bit more. Generally, extrusions like to have uh, rounded corners, although square corners are possible. They just run a little bit slower. So typically, where you can round the quarter corner or put radiuses in, you're better off. Extrusions run uh, fine if they're not symmetrical, but they run even better if they are symmetrical. And uh, one of the cool things of extrusions is you can put metal where you want it, not only for structural reasons, but sometimes for aesthetic reasons. So you can create various surface finishes for virtually no cost. I mean, there's no tooling cost. There's very little metal cost of putting some little stripes on and things like that. So there's often ways to uh, enhance the aesthetics and also, of course, the functionality of parts in extrusions very easily. This is a great example. It's actually from SAPA, uh, their, their design manual, which shows uh, this is a great way to make a part. You meant somebody familiar with steel might design a part like on the right because they're used to removing material away. and and from an extrusion viewpoint, you can design the tool with these ridges already in it. And if you're only using this portion as a spacer, uh, then why put the extra metal in? And why have extrusion problems? You're, you're going to extrude a little bit slower. And you're going to have more metal on the one on the right than the left. So extruders can help to guide you to make the proper decisions here. A few slides back, I was talking about the uh, circle size and some of the limitations there, and I, I mentioned very briefly in the slide a tongue ratio. And what a tongue ratio refers to is um, the piece of metal, steel in the die, that creates this narrow tongue on the, on the right, this little slot. Um, that tends to be a problem. You can do it. But the, the thinner and deeper this is, the less steel there is to prevent the, the aluminum from flowing. And you end up having to run very hot and slow. Otherwise, you can break the die. The tongue can break. So if this was going to be something where a, a, a solid um, vertical slab slid into here, you could have exact same functionality here. Just stepping this out a little bit on the left, you end up with a much wider tongue base and a much, much tougher, stronger die that will probably never give you a problem. And for a couple of ounces of extra metal, just these little offsets, you can end up with a part that does a much better job, much less expensive to purchase. So just some ideas. Again, work with your extruders. Um, one of the slides that uh, Jason showed you had some examples of different fastening. Uh, Self-tapping through screws, <coughs> excuse me, through screw bosses are often used. 
Uh, when designers are not familiar with aluminum, they tend to think of drilling a hole so they make it solid. This becomes a more expensive die than the one on the top. It's very easy to extrude in screw bosses that provide functionality to put end caps on things really, really easily. And uh, a couple other extrusion hints. The section on the left here shows a single hole hollow, and the one on the right is a three hole hollow. You know, one, two, and three. And if you don't need the physical separation of this part, you know, let's say there's not some different liquid or fluid or something going through here, well, then you're better off making this into a single hole hollow. The tooling is less expensive and it'll run better. Similarly, on the right, uh, these look like almost identical parts. When you look into the interior of it, you can see that the part on the right has a screw boss that's mounted to a horizontal member. And if you just remove that member and mount it to the vertical member next to it, you can often get exactly the same functionality and go from a two-hole hollow, which is a little bit more expensive or run slower, to a single-hole hollow. Excuse me. A lot of information about the extrusion um, requirements for design are located in the aluminum design manual. It's available from uh, www.aluminum.org, from the Aluminum Association. And this manual is really the Bible of designing things out of aluminum extrusions. And uh, one of the beautiful things about this manual, a lot, of, a lot of students and technical people, engineers, civil engineers, designers, don't get a lot of information about aluminum and aluminum extrusions in their uh, technical education. But the exact same things that they learn about steel, which would be included in the steel manual, are covered in the aluminum manual. In fact, it even covers the material in exactly the same um, Excuse me, exactly the same order, and I'll show you that in a little bit later. The next section of the presentation is going to touch briefly on uh, some suggested design steps to create an efficient extruded structure. Um, often, when you're working with extrusions, people are unfamiliar with them, so I pulled together a simple way to think through this. There's a lot of steps, but I think structural engineers will be used to thinking through these things, and I thought I would take a moment and show it to you. The first step is really to understand the uh, design objectives. What are the cost objectives, the performance objectives? Are there any aesthetic requirements? Is weight the biggest consideration, number of parts? You know, What is it that you're trying to achieve in the design? You really have to understand that up front. The number two thing um, is really to involve trusted extruders up front. And, um, I, I'm saying this because these guys have all the experience in the world about different types of shapes. They know what will run well and what won't run well. And they'll often also know solutions to the things you're trying to achieve. You may be thinking one way to achieve it, and they may have a much different and possibly much better way to do it that they've seen incorporated in extrusion designs in the past. So I encourage anybody working with uh, a new design out of extrusion to involve the extruder, extruders pretty, pretty early in the process. It'll help them to get a more efficient process. As I discussed earlier, um, and you, when you start thinking about parts, you need to think about different alloys, and you'll probably settle on you know one or two alloys depending on the part applications. And again, if the, if the yield strength, yield and tensile are important, you're probably going to want 6005A. If if not, if it's used in a compressive buckling situation, for example, 6060 or 6063 would be um, probably lower cost alternatives to achieve the same goals. When you're looking at any kind of a structure, it's going to be mounted somewhere. It's going to be you know, mounted in some part of North America or wherever it's going to go. And you'll have different wind loads and different snow loads that you need to take into account. This is true of any structure made out of any material. But you need to understand the location requirements and then the, the resulting loads that come onto it. And then you also have to understand if there's any other functional requirements. This is a CSP frame design. Um, this is uh, because of the CSP concentrated solar power. It relies on these mirrors sunbeams hitting these mirrors and focusing onto a collector tube. So any twist in the frame from wind loads and weight of the, of the frame can actually cause the, the beams to miss the collector tube and make it less efficient. So in this case, this is a functional requirement that you need to know about. There may be other functional requirements, you know, maybe shadowing issues and things like that that you need to know when you're working on a PV, for example. So you, the goal is to uh, detail out all your known constraints. In this case, another CSP application you know, needs to be mounted high enough off the ground that it can actually pivot and not hit the ground. Simple thing, but need to know that as a fun functional constraint. 
And then the then the games start. This is the video gaming part of uh, the process, is what it seems like to me. Uh, you develop alternative geometries, and you look at different ways to skin the cat. You say, hey, I'm going to mount these PV frames. How do I do it? Do I do it on something that has, you know, three posts into the ground? Do I do it with one post into the ground? Four, two, six, whatever the number may be. I just showed a couple examples here. And then you start looking, okay, if I'm going to do a three-post design, how do I mount the, the, the panel beams? Do I mount them this direction? Do I mount them the other direction? If I do a single post design, how do I do it? Do I have the main beam running this way? Do I have the main beam running this way? Do I set it up like a, a clothes dryer, an old-time clothes dryer, to dump some of the loads off onto the pylon? You know, what are some of the different alternatives? So you develop these different geometries. Now, if you're going to try to work through these designs in infinite detail, at this point, you spend a lot of engineering time. So instead of that, you, you use what are called, uh, what I call idealized members. So we, we use a program called RAM Elements, but this is available in many, many different uh, technical formats. You can buy software to do this. This is typically software that a structural engineer or civil engineer or mechanical engineer would use, where you can create a geometry, and each of these members can be an idealized member just describing the, um, you know, the um, moment of inertia of the part and the radius of gyration and some of those different things. And then you create the geometry that describes the part. This is the frame with the pylon coming up and a beam going this way and a couple other beams and then the panel rails. And then you put the loads onto it where the wind loads and weight would be. And then you can, from an idealized viewpoint, run it through the software to analyze what's going to happen. How is this whole thing going to deform under different loads? How will the members behave? What type of stresses will they be under? You can use this information to iteratively go through and design new idealized members. You might need to put a little bit more meat in something or take a little bit of metal away somewhere else. You can vary the part geometries, and you can also uh, vary the spacing, so you know the spacing between things. Um, and by doing this, you can iteratively work through different solutions very, very quickly once it's modeled and say, well, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do the other thing? Then you use that information and you pull it together into analysis, not just looking at the metal cost, but also looking at the fabrication, an estimation of fabrication, handling, shipment costs. And you can get close to an understanding of what the different alternative designs might look like cost-wise. So you can take these designs and you can, you can lay out, in this case, the, for example, these pylons are steel and there's a certain installation cost of each of the steel pylons and the rest of it is aluminum. So how much of aluminum, how much steel, how many fasteners, what the foundation costs, what the fabrication and subassembly costs are. You build up all the costs to come up with a dollar per watt and you can look at different designs to see which ones really make the most sense. And uh, there are trade-offs. Sometimes the lowest cost may have uh, more complication or more number of parts than somebody's willing to work with, um, and but at least get you closer. So you use this idealized frame design to get you pretty close. And then you start to zero in a little bit more. You pick a couple of the likely frame designs that you want to work on and that you want to analyze more in more depth in depth. You can use the Again, digging into the aluminum design manual to get into the exact part design requirements, hold edge distances and things like that. Run it through Autodesk Inventor or one of the other uh, software that can do FEA and other part designs for you to actually see how each part will be loaded and what the actual parts will look like, not from an idealized standpoint, but the actual parts. And then uh, you often have to iteratively, iteratively design because if you come up with a different way of connecting you know, this beam onto this one, for example, well, this may induce loads into here, or if you had a different connection, not a three bolts, but something else, it might change the wall thicknesses that are required here, which then might further influence how this I-beam reacts. So sometimes you have to go through a few iterations, but now you're only iter iterating on a couple of different uh, alternatives, not every possible alternative. When we've actually worked on these systems, <coughs> We, we've done, you know, sometimes 60 or 80 different uh, idealized alternatives to get down to the two or three that make the most sense. At this point, you now know what the parts have to do, each individual part, and you may actually go back and decide that one part should be 6005A and one part should be 6063, et cetera. So again, work with your extruders to say, hey, should I make this part out of a different material? 
all along you've probably been keeping your uh, your management in touch with what the design alternatives are, but hopefully by now you've boiled it down and you've not only done the idealized part, which was on the left here, but you've done some actual part designs so you can provide the decision makers with some real alternatives that they can help to uh, make a proper decision. And then the one or two designs they choose, you have to uh, excuse me, you have to detail out the chosen designs, perhaps uh, you know some more part design, perhaps uh, make some rapid prototype parts so they can see how the various parts fit together. And then it's time to go out and get quotations, make your final decisions, work with extruders on the tolerancing requirements, what's possible, et cetera. And you end up with, uh, with a good design, possibly a couple designs to consider. Again, you can get a lot of the information you need for these design, um, design requirements through the Aluminum Design Manual from the Aluminum Association which uh, very closely marries up with the steel manual. In fact, the table of contents and the way it's organized are identical. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the ADM will give you a lot of information about safety factors and all the different formula that you need in order to make the proper decisions. So uh, that's available from the Aluminum Association. A course is actually taught on it through ASCE, ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, so that if you have a designer who's familiar with steel but not with aluminum, this would be an easy way to get them some background on it, get them some comfort so that they can understand how the manual is organized and understand how to use the various tables in it. It's really to get them the comfort that they need to know that it's really not that different from the way that they're used to designing things. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, pretty much the end of my presentation. There's some information available from AEC.org, which I would... I definitely recommend that you look at. There's a, a listing of different extruders by ge geometry, by their capabilities. Lots of information and case studies available that can uh, spark your interest and ideas. Uh, there's a buyer's guide available, an, extrusion, an aluminum extrusion manual available online. So there's a lot of free information available that can help to give you alternative things to think about, alternative extruders to talk to, etc. Uh, extrusions are really a wonderful process. You put metal where you want it. It's strong, it's light, it's corrosion resistant. It's got great value at end of life. It requires virtually no maintenance throughout its lifetime. So what may seem like the most expensive material up front can actually end up being the lowest cost uh, long-term alternative, even the lowest cost installed alternative, not even worrying about the maintenance and end of life value. But you uh, have to do your work. So I, I want to thank our presenting uh, sponsors. We have representatives uh, from both SAPA and Vitex here with us today. They're uh, two of the, the many extrusion extruders that make up the Aluminum Extrusion Extruders Council. You'll see a list of those later. And with that, I'm going to turn control back over to Kathy, who will handle the Q&A section of this. Hi, Craig. This is Stacy. I will go ahead and ask the, the questions that I have here. OK, thank um, you. No problem. I'm sorry that we, we lost Kathy there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read this question. It says, can you compare the embodied CO2 between alumina, aluminum and steel production if both are made of recycled materials? Also, are the low CO2 raw aluminum extrusion ignite that Alcan pioneered overseas with high recycle content percentage and the balanced renewable power produce aluminum now available in the U.S.? Um, um, this this is Jason. Um, I, I guess I, I can't. Obviously, don't work for a primary aluminum smelter, so I can't answer the uh, uh, as far as the CO2 uh, content or the basically the emissions during the process. I'd be happy if you want to contact me after uh, we can work through that one together. But I would say that the biggest advantage um, in the recycling of aluminum is the fact that it only takes five percent of the energy to recycle the aluminum than it took to make brand new. So if you start from basically bauxite to alumina to aluminum, uh, which is the refining and smelting process that that goes through, that is the most energy intensive part. Uh, it's actually the, the creation of the, of the virgin material. Um, so recycling it has a huge benefit, and basically you can almost look at aluminum as a as a as an energy bank because again you can uh, you almost get everything out of it as what you put into it. So 
Um, so from that, I, I do believe that the most, um, the highest percentage of CO2 emissions come from the actual power that is required to smelt the primary aluminum, although I'm, I'm not exactly sure on that. As far as the recycled content of, of alloys, that will vary um, depending upon the alloy. We do have some alloys uh, at SAPA that have uh, uh, 75 to 80% recycled scrap content, but those are alloys that are more for uh, machining purposes um, than they are for aesthetic purposes. So it really depends on what you're trying to do with it. Um, you know, if you're going to anodize it, if you need to make, you know, if it needs to look good, um, because as the scrap content will go up, your surface finish uh, basically will degrade uh, along with the scrap content. I'd like to add on to that for a moment. I don't remember the source of this, but there was information out from either the Aluminum Association or the AEC that showed the total carbon footprint of uh, aluminum versus alternative materials. And Jason's absolutely right about most of the carbon footprint coming in the uh, the manufacturing of the, the smelting of the aluminum. But when you looked at the entire use of aluminum uh, throughout North America, it was much, much lower to have aluminum than steel, for example, when you took the actual recycled content into account. I just don't have those numbers at my fingertip. I saw that in the presentation several months ago. Uh, why don't we continue with a question for Jason here. If someone's interested in the potential of sequential prototyping. Can you say more about turnaround time and costs? Um, the, the, the turnaround type um, or the, the amount of time that it's going to take to turn that around will be dependent upon the, the, I guess, the complexity of the profile. So let's just start if it's basically a, you know, a simple solid shape. Um, we'd probably be looking at around two weeks uh, to build that die. Uh, and a solid shape is relatively uh, relatively quick to do. As far as cost, it's going to depend on what size press it's going on. Um, the bigger the press, the higher the cost. Um, so we so so again, it, it's going to it's going to vary a little bit. Usually, there's uh, you know if you're below a minimum press quantity, which will also depend on press size. Um, you know, there's there could be a setup charge involved. Um, although at, at SAPA at least, and there's some other shops out there, we do have some rapid prototyping capabilities. We do have a couple small presses that we can do a fairly uh, uh, a, a low cost. Um, but again, remember that uh, you know the sequential prototyping is more into um, the fact that we do create the production tool right there. So we go you know very quickly from prototype to to production. The next one is, if joining through fasteners is done, then what precautions should be taken? Can you repeat that? Uh, we have one for a Could you repeat the question? Yes, I can. If joining through fasteners is done, then what precautions should be taken? What precautions should be taken when joining with fasteners in aluminum? Um, the answer to that is simply uh, that we would have to review the design of the two profiles that they're seeking to join and what they're looking to join them with. If it's, for instance, a pop type fastener, um, that's a whole other uh, picture that has to be taken into account and also um, thicknesses of the aluminum versus some um, uh, nut and bolt type fastener situation. But at the end of the day, um, to answer that in a general response would be difficult. Uh, the extruder would need to review the prints as well as the finished component to assist the customer in any way they can in making the recommendation. The information on this is also available in the aluminum design manual. 
could they could be asking a question about the type of uh, fastener, whether it's steel or aluminum. There's galvanic corrosion uh, things to take into consideration, which are easily handled, but need to be the questions need to be asked so they can be properly addressed. All that information, including hold edge distances and things like that, are in the aluminum design manual. Okay, thank you. Um, a next question is: What percent recycled content can effectively be extruded versus only being able to be machined? I'll step in again. Um, essentially, uh, with a typical extrusion plant, 100% of your production process scrap, as well as the turnings from the machining and or punching operations, are fully recycled back into billet to be re-extruded. Does that answer the question? I think they were going a little further and asking what percentage of recycled material can you actually extrude. Well, uh, Warner Company uh, used to have its own casting facilities, so we uh, we designed ladders and we had the aluminum extrusion presses and we had our own casting. And you can virtually extrude 100% recycled content. Um, there's really nothing holding you back from that. Maybe some minor surface finish variations if you're doing really, really high finish work. But for most structural applications, you can do 100%. You often don't have that much scrap available. And Would further, I'll just add that 6005A is very conducive to extruding as a secondary or uh, alloy produced from uh, process scrap versus, say, 6063 alloy. Okay, and it looks like we have time for just one more question. So uh, I am going to say, can you put just some additional uh, light on what aluminum and steel joining is? Um, I'm going to refer to you, Craig, again. Yeah, maybe if you could give me control of the, uh, the slides again. I'll pull up the slide, I think, that has that in it. Otherwise, it'll just be words on my end. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I'm going to just try to page back quite far. I can't tell how far back I'm going. But um, aluminum extrusions um, can be joined by many different ways. They can be, you know, certainly welded or brazed or soldered or that kind of thing. But more, more likely, we're talking about fastening, either with um, mechanical fasteners such as rivets or pins or nut and bolt connection. They can also be uh, slipped together, um, slip fit or snap fit together. Sorry, I don't have a view of the left side here, so I can't tell what slide to click on quickly. Um, they, can be, um, they can be friction stir welded together, which is actually an interesting way to take an extrusion and make a much, much wider shape than would otherwise be capable. Um, Jason or Andy, you have other, other ideas? They can be swedged. That's the way ladder rungs were uh, connected to ladder rails. It was a swedging operation. Adhesively uh, bonded. That's another big use of aluminum extrusions now. There's more and more things being adhesively bonded. I think that probably gives a relatively good answer to the question. Okay, thank you, Craig. I'm going to take us back down to the question slide here. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, you're okay. Okay, and that's all the time that we have for the questions today. So, again, I would like every, to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, this webinar will be available on solarpowerworldonline.com, and we will be emailing a follow-up within the next one or two days with a link to the webinar and the slides. Again, if you would like to tweet any key points and takeaways, please use hashtag solarwebinar. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, we will also be sending out the part one of the webinar from earlier this year in that follow-up email. And if you have any questions, please contact either Jason or Andy listed in the question slide here. 
I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and have a wonderful day.